It's four o'clock. The top stories live on 7 News. Donald Trump, former president turned convicted criminal. Jail time hanging over his head after a historic jury verdict. An 18-year-old pea plater killed after crashing her car in Wetherill Park. Three of her passengers hurt. And the Immigration Minister saving his job for now. The Prime Minister giving no guarantees he'll survive until the next election. Live from Sydney, 7 News with Sally Bowery. Good afternoon. There's a very real possibility that a US president could go to jail. Donald Trump, a convicted criminal. In a historic decision, one he branded a disgrace, a jury found he paid a porn star and falsified records to sway the result of an election. Outside the New York court, supporters shed tears. Enemies, on the other hand, were ecstatic. The real verdict, Trump claims, will be on November 5th, when Americans vote. US Bureau Chief David Woodward starts today's coverage from Manhattan. Well, Donald Trump is tonight back inside his Manhattan penthouse apartment, a former president and now a convicted criminal. The jury returned its verdict after just 12 hours of deliberation and they were unanimous. They had to be the foreman announcing Donald J. Trump guilty on all 34 counts of falsifying business records, finding he conspired to pay off adult film star Stormy Daniels to influence the 2016 election. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. News of the historic verdict quickly ricocheted around the court precinct. It's about time he's guilty on many more than 34 charges, so it's about time something actually stuck on him. I'm surprised because it's the first time he's been nailed for anything. I don't know how it'll play out, but I'm thrilled. And around the world. Donald Trump has now been convicted of 34 different felony crimes by a jury of his peers in Manhattan. You can see a lot of the attention is now flowing through, but this is a historic moment for the United States. There is no doubt about it. Never before has a president, a former president or otherwise, been up on criminal charges. Joe Biden using the moment to pitch for any disgruntled Republicans. There's only one way to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office, and that's at the ballot box. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And they know what happened here and everybody knows what happened here. The verdict sets up an explosive sentencing hearing back here in this courthouse in just 41 days. And Judge Juan Mashan, the man who's become a target of Trump hate, will have that job. He has a range of options available, fines for one, but prison is not off the table. And even if Trump does go to jail, technically he can still run for president. Just yeah. as a technical matter, somebody with a felony couldn't work in the West Wing. But mm -hmm. you could be the president of the United States in the yes, West Wing. Yes, yes, there, there is. crazy. <laughs> Talk about a double standard. Team Trump has already begun spinning the verdict with some success too. His donations website today crashed, overwhelmed with traffic. Supporters, no doubt, but the question Democrats are asking is, will this turn any away? And I think that uh, overall, I think it's going to help his chances. People are going to think that, uh, you know, He's a guy who's being in this witch hunt or whatever. The star witness, disgraced lawyer Michael Cohen and adult film star Stormy Daniels, both of whom were thrust into the international spotlight when charges were laid, have both expressed their relief tonight at the result and the fact that this is now over. I guess the word is relieved. This has been six years in the making. The very first time I ever met with the district attorney's office was while I was an inmate in Otisville. They came up to see me on three separate occasions. So this is a six year process within which for accountability to finally be had. While the man who brought the charges, prosecutor Alvin Bragg, has defended the process and integrity of the trial against a barrage of vitriol from the former president. While this defendant may be unlike any other in American history, we arrived at this trial and ultimately today at this verdict in the same manner as every other case that comes through the courtroom doors, by following the facts and the law and doing so without fear or favor. Trump has already begun spinning this online with supporters, ammunition for a campaign that has the edge over the current president, Joe Biden, in a number of crucial swing states. No doubt polling has already begun in those states to see if this verdict, as history-making as it is, has changed any hearts and minds that had planned on voting for Donald Trump 
in the upcoming November election. David Woywood there. And Anthony Albanese was cautiously tight-lipped when asked about the case this morning. It is important uh, that the Prime Minister of Australia uh, not comment. We're not a party to these court proceedings. Uh, so uh, we regard that as a matter for the United States and their system as we regard uh, the election of uh, the US president uh, to be a matter for uh, the people of the United States as well. I obviously have, uh, people might have observed, a close relationship with President Biden. Uh, we get on very well, but the relationship between Australia and the United States is a relationship between nations, not just between individuals. The Prime Minister there and later this hour, analysis on what the verdict will mean for the US election. To other news now, and a teenager has been killed and three others are in hospital this afternoon after a crash at Wetherill Park. Security video captured the car they were in, crossing onto a median strip at speed before slamming into a tree. Andrew Denny reports. Yes, a devastating scene here last night that confronted locals and emergency services when a carload full of teenagers slammed into a tree here on the Horsley Drive at Wetherill Park. Sadly, with deadly consequences. You could hear it. It was like loud. Their lives are lost. Now this impact was captured on nearby security cameras and a warning on what you're about to see. The Honda Accord clearly speeding before the vehicle somehow veers off the road and straight into those trees. An 18-year-old woman on her pee plates was driving. She died at the scene. Her passengers, two males aged 16 and 17, and two women, 17 and 19, were all seriously injured, taken to Liverpool and Westmead hospitals. How are you going to tell the parents that their daughter or their son is killed in a car accident? Yeah, it is very hard. It is very hard. Very fast. Very too fast. Too young. Today is Fatality Free Friday, an initiative designed to reduce the road toll. However, sadly, New South Wales has now lost 151 people in crashes so far this year, 24 more than the same time last year. Now, despite those repeated calls for drivers to take more care, police say they are growing frustrated that that message isn't being heard. Meanwhile, a motorcycle group has held a candlelit vigil for two of their members killed in a collision with a car in Greenacre. The community club says they're hurting beyond comprehension and will dearly miss 26-year-old William Brown and Doey Choi. They lit up every room, every place that we were in and we loved having them. Every time I saw uh, Doey and, and Will, you know, they were full of joy, we're always joking around. A fundraiser's been set up by the group to cover the costs of the funerals. The Immigration Minister's job is safe for now, despite dozens of murderers, rapists and pedophiles having their visas extended because of his written direction. Let's go live to our reporter Josh Martin at Parliament House this afternoon. Hey there, Josh. The Prime Minister has been quizzed about whether he would sack Andrew Giles. At this stage, he seems safe. Yes, Sally, good afternoon. Anthony Albanese has fronted his first press conference this week. Since this saga blew up, the PM was asked whether Andrew Giles would stay as Immigration Minister until the next election. In response, Mr Albanese launched a counter-attack on Opposition Leader Peter Dutton for releasing 1,300 offenders from immigration detention when he was Home Affairs Minister. The PM also said the government had passed laws to abolish and replace the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. That's the legal body that has reinstated these criminals' visas and said the minister was rewriting Direction 99. But his defence of Mr Giles' long-term job security was less than convincing. Take a listen. Will Andrew Giles be Immigration Minister? Uh, Andrew Giles uh, is the Immigration Minister, I'm the Prime Minister and uh, I have uh, no uh, intentions of uh, making uh, changes imminent. Sally, the head of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal has been grilled by Senators this afternoon. That's the legal body that's overturned 184 visa cancellations in the last year alone. That's more than 50% of the cases they've heard because of the Minister's direction to consider people's ties to Australia and that's allowed those criminals to stay in this country. 
the decisions that we make, we are accountable and responsible for. The Minister would have the capacity to effectively quash the decision of the Tribunal under Section 501A. Sally, this afternoon some political commentators here in Canberra are still tipping that Andrew Giles, the Immigration Minister, will lose that job in a winter reshuffle. All right, well, time will tell. Thank you very much, Joss Martin in Canberra. Still to come in Sydney's afternoon news on 7, will Donald Trump actually go to jail? Our expert weighs in. The big names of Sydney's struggling hospitality cry out for help, their survival at stake. And pro-Palestine activists turn on police after vandalising Labor MP officers. In 7 News. Yes! Treating back pain as child's play. Relief without the surgery. It's paid off. I'm wonderful now. The high-tech help giving Aussies their lives back. Got them to start thinking about pain differently. Our exclusive medical report, 7 News at 6. Hello, tonight in 7 News, Donald Trump guilty a historic day in the US. Will he go to jail? Can he still become president? We have expert analysis in our special coverage. Also tonight, tornadoes and rain as wild weather moves towards Sydney and exclusive, the new simple fix for back pain. That's Sydney's 7 News at 6. We'll see you then. A pro-Palestine protest has descended into violence, scuffles breaking out with police and activists vandalising the offices of Labor MPs. Rory Campbell was among the chaos. Pro-Palestine protesters have laid siege to a defence capabilities event here on Collins Street in Melbourne on the same morning Labor MPs and their offices targeted by bandits. Tensions boiled over as protesters blocked the entrance to the building. Scuffles broke out between office workers trying to get through and activists. One worker poured a drink over a protester who hit him in the head with a megaphone and scratched his face. I poured a coffee at her. And then what did she do? Well then she attacked me with the megaphone. I stepped away, protected myself, like just put my arm up like that. And then she attacked me and scratched me in the face as well, which you can see. They've initiated that. I've been pushed and shoved by plenty of people that have been trying to get in the building without actually doing anything. People here would not be doing that to people unless they were causing that kind of agitation. And that is unfortunately something that people who are against the violation of human rights continue to face from agitators who are upset about the things that we're upset about. The protesters were targeting an event that Labor Minister Natalie Hutchins was speaking at, looking at ways to grow the defence supply chain. Businesses in the area were caught up in the commotion as well. How much money do you think you're losing right now? A few grand. The group had tried to force their way into the building through one entrance, but were blocked by police and security. They marched to another entrance and were able to get in to block a doorway and cause the disruption they were hoping for. Earlier this morning, a number of Labor MPs had their offices targeted. Red paint splashed across the buildings in at least four locations. Today's action comes after the Greens' motion to recognise the state of Palestine was blocked in the federal parliament. Among protesters' demands today are for the government to end any links with weapons companies involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict. The owners of high-profile Sydney restaurants have held crisis talks today to find a way to save the struggling hospitality industry. Wes Lambert is the CEO of the Australian Restaurant and Cafe Association. He joins us this afternoon. Wes, thank you so much for your time. Um, it is a very tough time in the whole business community at the moment, but particularly for hospitality. What are the biggest challenges being faced by the industry at the moment? Oh, look, thanks so much uh, for having me this afternoon. Uh, the industry is facing unprecedented challenges, from skill shortages to migration uh, to cost of doing business to increased wage costs uh, to increased rents and really a slowdown in diner demand. And so it's a, a, a bit of a perfect storm for the industry at the moment. Uh, and we came together today uh, to talk about how to lobby governments to uh, ensure that the restaurant and cafe segment of accommodation food service continues to thrive. You've been in the industry for more than 30 years. Have you ever seen things this bad? Oh, look, I had a restaurant group uh, in Australia, in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra, uh, from 2009 until 2012. And we certainly did not see anything like this. Uh, and I've been around the hospitality industry uh, for 
nearly 30 years. Mm -hmm. And look, I've heard from many restaurateurs who've said uh, that this is as tough as it's ever been. Yeah, and we've seen a whole number of, you know, some of our most famous restaurants shutting down and, and people saying that they can no longer operate in conditions like this, which is certainly a trend we don't want to see continuing. On the other side, in terms of your customers, you know, generally Australians are cutting back. We've got prices continuing to grow up. People are struggling uh, just to do things like go out for a meal. So how do you survive this period where we do have that, that, that crunch going on? Look, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, certainly thriving during tough economic times. Uh, they're about ensuring that um, as a diner, that you continue to dine at your favorite cafes and restaurants. Uh, as local and state governments, it's about uh, reinvigorating the industry, certainly with more outdoor dining, um, certainly more uh, flexible hours for those diners to dine in those businesses. Uh, we need a strong nighttime economy uh, in New South Wales. And it's about potentially bringing back the Dine and Discover program, which worked so well uh, just after the COVID pandemic. So you're talking about those COVID star vouchers. Is that what you're asking? Is that what emerged from this morning's crisis talks, that you need the government to step in and actually start helping in a, on a financial sort of level with this? Oh, look, we, we discussed many things. We came to, to three main policy priorities uh, on a national and state level. Uh, migration, taxation and IR. But uh, in the uh, taxation or cost of doing business space, certainly looking to the local and state governments in New South Wales uh, to work alongside the hospitality industry to ensure that uh, restaurants and cafes can continue to thrive. Yeah, and customers, all of us certainly want to see that. All right. Thank you, Wes Lambert, for your time this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Next in Seven's Afternoon News, we'll have sport with Matt Carmichael, including a day off for the Blues as Mitch Moses gets Parramatta going again. Also, wipeouts and perfect tens. Luke Doncic takes down the Timberwolves and Snoop Dogg. It's been a pretty big day of sport overseas. Plus, later Sydney Siders heading to the regions for a more affordable lifestyle. Who's moving and where are they going to? Donald Trump, guilty. What it means for him, will he go to jail? This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. What it means for the US election, can he still become president? Expert analysis from our team of reporters in a Donald Trump special on 7 News tonight at 6. Matt's here with Sport Now and Matt. New South Wales and Queensland, they took it pretty easy today, didn't they? Tough life in Origin <laughs> Camp, isn't it, Sal? Good afternoon. Both teams enjoyed the day off from training as they head into the final stretch before Origin won out of Core Stadium on Wednesday. Rain spoiled plans for a day of golf for the Blues in the Blue Mountains. It was all business for the Sky Blues today, who can wrap up the first women's three-game series in Game 2 on Thursday night. After switching from rugby two years ago, Grace Kemp has just as much hatred for the Maroons as anyone. So now it's surreal being able to pull on a blue jersey and be on the other side of the screen. But yeah, I've carried that on from a very young age and it's very different going onto the field and actually ripping into them. A record crowd of 33,000 is expected in Newcastle. Mitch Moses' return might add pressure on Nico Hines to fire on Wednesday night. Moses made a classy return from foot surgery last night with Clint Gutherson also back from a knee injury. Moses' man of the match performance snapped a five-game losing streak, 34-22 over the Sharks. I tried to come back early enough. I gave it every, every chance and tried my best, but it just didn't come up. I couldn't go out the field and you know let the boys down, really. He's probably one of the best halfbacks in, in the league at the moment, and... If you're missing him, it's, it's a big loss. Cronulla dropped to second on the ladder behind Melbourne Storm. The Matildas begin two so-called friendlies with China tonight that double as cutthroat selection trials for the Paris Olympics. Coach Tony Gustafson settled on 14 of his squad, leaving four more places up for grabs and nine players going for them. It is a tough camp in the sense of, you know, the team's going to be selected and there's a few more nerves and... You know, this is the last opportunity to kind of prove yourself. After tonight's sold-out match in Adelaide, the Matildas come to Sydney for another sell-out, more than 80,000 at a core stadium on Monday night. Alex Dimonor is through to the third round at the French Open for the first time. The Demon dominated Jean Meneur, 7-5, 6-1, 6-4, his second straight sets victory. World number one Novak Djokovic used every part of centre court in a straight sets win over Roberto Cabeas-Bena. 
build my form uh, as the tournament progresses, hopefully, and then peak at, uh, at the right time when it matters the most. The Nasi Kokonakis came from two sets down to defeat Julio Zeperi. It is the second straight year into the third round at Roland Garros. And Aussie stars Josh Green and Dante Exum are off to the NBA Finals thanks to a Luka Doncic masterclass. Doncic again, another three. Got it! He's a flamethrower! He is on fire! The Slovenian superstar even had time to trash talk Snoop Dogg at courtside on his way to 36 points in the Mavericks' 124 to 103 win over the Timberwolves, sealing the Western Conference Finals 4 1. They'll play the Celtics for the championship. We've just seen one of the all time days on Surfing's Championship Tour at Chopu. Kelly's on a bomb. Big roomy barrel, and he comes out. Don't ever count Slater out. It was 52-year-old King Kelly, three-time world champ Gabriel Medina matching perfect tens with bone-rattling wipeouts. The Tahiti Pro Final came down to Italo Ferreira and John John Florence, whose late 9.33 wasn't enough to deny Brazil's 2019 world champion. Unbelievable. Apparently uh, Snoop Dogg once sent a crying emoji at Doncic, so that was why Doncic was going back at him today in the middle of a playoffs game. I don't think I'd ever take on Snoop Dogg, no, but so anyway, <laughs> thanks so. for that, Matt. This afternoon's top stories are next, including Donald Trump, a convicted criminal. How it will sway undecided US voters ahead of the November election. A serial rapist sentenced to jail 20 years after the crimes across Sydney, the DNA breakthrough. And the Princess of Wales to miss a key royal engagement as she undergoes cancer treatment. Sydney better than Fergo, Mel and Angie. Seven News. Nobody knows news better. Live from Sydney, Seven News with Sally Bowery. Our top story this hour, that history-making moment in a New York courtroom. Donald Trump, the first ever US president to become a convicted criminal. The jury in his hush money trial found him guilty of paying off a porn star to win the White House, a decision that impacts his chances of moving back in. Former President Donald Trump found guilty, convicted by a Manhattan jury of all charges. Now the first American president ever convicted of a crime. Jurors finding Mr. Trump guilty on all 34 counts of falsifying his business records to cover up a conspiracy to influence the 2016 election by hiding how he reimbursed his former fixer for paying off a porn star before the election. The Manhattan jury of seven men and five women included two lawyers, two in finance and the foreman in sales and reached their decision after two days of deliberations after hearing from more than 20 witnesses over six weeks. The prosecution's case largely came down to whether jurors would believe the word of Michael Cohen, Mr. Trump's former attorney and self-described fixer. Cohen was the only witness who directly tied Mr. Trump to the alleged crime of falsifying business records. He testified Mr. Trump directed him to pay off Stormy Daniels so she couldn't derail his campaign. She'd alleged a sexual encounter years before, but Mr. Trump vehemently denied it. Prosecutors argued at trial the former president was desperate to keep her silent, panicked after the release of the Access Hollywood tape, and then covered it all up, approving a scheme to disguise the $130,000 payoff with a phony paper trail through invoices, vouchers, and checks. Cohen's credibility in this case was key. The defense team branding the now disbarred lawyer who'd been convicted of lying under oath as the MVP of liars with an axe to grind against Mr. Trump. While prosecutors argued Mr. Trump chose Mr. Cohen for the same qualities that his attorneys now urge you to reject his testimony. 
Mr. Trump, who did not testify reacting to the verdict, attacking the case as politically motivated by a Democratic DA in deep blue Manhattan. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. The real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people, and they know what happened. Outside of court, boos and cheers. Late today, District Attorney Alvin Bragg reacting to the verdict. We arrived at this trial, and ultimately today at this verdict, in the same manner as every other case that comes through the courtroom doors. By following the facts and the law, Political scientist Simon Jackman joins us this afternoon from Canberra. Simon, it was a history-making day. Uh, this verdict certainly plays straight into the MAGA handbook, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Trump came out of that courtroom guns blazing, immediately pivoting from being a criminal defendant, now convicted felon, back to being a candidate, weaving the story of this trial into a reason why he should be elected president. So very much back to Donald Trump being Donald Trump, mm. liberated from having spent all that time in a courtroom, but holding this up as evidence of how badly the system does not want him to be president again. How do you see this playing out with middle America as we lead into this November election? How do you think this is going to play out? Um, two, two observations here. One, I'm astonished if there would be anybody who needs to hear any more to have a view about Donald Trump's fitness for office, number one. But that said, presidential elections, the last two, and I expect this one as well, be, will be decided by about a half million voters in three states, Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. And I think that are there any undecided voters there for whom this is a bridge too far or a reason to stay with Donald Trump? That's who this is all about. Right now, Biden is trailing in those key states that he needs to win. Does this put Biden in a stronger position that he's been struggling in uh, in those states thus far? Ultimately, do you think Donald Trump will end up in jail generally for the, the type of offence he has been convicted? You don't see jail time, but do you think we could actually see that kind of sentence? No, no I don't. I tend to think uh, probation and a large financial fine is probably the sentencing that's going to come come at the end of the day. Um, the other thing is the appeal process is going to take a long time. The sentencing will be just days before a very significant uh, conference for the Republicans. We're expecting the sentencing on July 11. Uh, uh, how will that affect things, do you think? Oh, I, again, just like we saw at Trump this afternoon uh, coming out of the courtroom, uh, he will springboard this. This is he will use his sentencing on July 11. Uh, th it will figure prominently. That's going to be Trump week. Uh, the convention will end. Uh, four days of convention will end with Trump uh, accepting the nomination and making a big speech. But the week will begin with him being convicted. So it's it, if anything, it's from a Republican perspective, it's great optics. It's a great runway to to Trump being coronated the nominee at the end of the at the end of the conference at the end of the convention. He says he'll appeal and that could tie things up in terms of actually seeing uh, any penalty well after the November period. Right. So, so what will it look like when that appeals process plays out? Like, could that go into next year? How does that work in the American system? Oh, I, absolutely. That could easily go in the next year. And I, I ex fully expect, irrespective of the election result, that Donald Trump would appeal this all the way into federal court, right? We're in state courts, as, as state criminal offences. He will look for a way to get this before the US Supreme Court, ultimately, I think, uh, to rule on the constitutionality of the, of the way they've linked the two sets of offences he's been convicted of. Simon Jackman, thanks for your time this afternoon. We appreciate your insights. Thank you. A serial rapist who terrorised Sydney back in 2003 and 2004 was today jailed for up to 17 years. Darren Kennedy attacked women who were home alone, leaving DNA evidence which was useless at the time, but which led to a forensic breakthrough. Leonie Ryan has been covering the case.
Good afternoon. Well, Darren Kennedy was held unaccountable for his actions for two decades until today. A judge describing his behaviour as depraved and callous. The 54-year-old was arrested after a police strike force was set up to investigate a spate of sexual attacks in Sydney's inner west in the early 2000s. Because the rapes were similar and in the same area, police thought they were dealing with one offender. They found the same DNA profiles at Croydon, Bondi, Bexley and Marrickville for crimes committed in 2003 and 2004. The problem was the DNA wasn't on file, so police had to be patient, and in 2021, advancements in technology finally gave them a hit. But it wasn't back to Kennedy. Instead, police narrowed down the suspect pool by identifying a relative with a different surname who had already served time in jail. Kennedy was arrested and has been in custody ever since. In sentencing the serial rapist, the judge said the attacks occurred in darkness and all in circumstances where the victim was alone and vulnerable. She said his conduct was utterly callous and degrading. Darren Kennedy was sentenced to a maximum 17 years and four months with a non-parole period of 13 years. He was also warned he could be held back longer than his maximum sentence if it's deemed he's still a danger to the community. The number of city slickers moving out of the big smoke is at a 12-month high and Sydney siders are most likely to pack up according to a new survey. Liz Ritchie is the CEO of Regional Australia Institute. Hello Liz, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, let's start with one of the most popular areas for a tree or sea change that we're seeing. We're pleased today to launch the, the hot spots. Uh, across our new regional movements index quarterly report. And consistently we see that uh, the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast are generally one and two. Uh, but closely following that, we also have places like uh, Geelong and Nurebul and gorgeous Fraser Island. But if you look at percentage growth, there are places like Belgium in New South Wales, a uh, beautiful rural community that's also uh, coming to the top five in terms of growth. Yeah, and the research has been pretty staggering. I mean, it's 20% above the pre-COVID levels. What about Sydney ciders? Where are we going specifically? Yeah, well, Sydney ciders continue to be um, the city where the most exodus is happening, uh, sitting at a little under 70% of all movers are coming out of Sydney. So there's a lot happening there. Um, predominantly, when we look at New South Wales and where Sydney ciders head to, it is uh, Wollongong uh, and uh, Newcastle. Uh, regional New South Wales has also taken the top spot in terms of where other estates are also locate, relocating to as well. I mean, I guess it is fair to say cost of living is, is behind this. Is that a, a big motivating force? Yes, it is, absolutely. The cost of living is biting hard, as is uh, housing affordability, and I think the two go hand in hand. Uh, but certainly here at the Institute, we've been tracking this movement for a long time. We know that one in five city dwellers um, want to leave the capital cities, and today's report is just further evidence of this. And is there a particular group, I mean, given cost of living, that obviously affects young people, uh, is there a demographic in particular you're seeing moving from the city to the country? Yes, there is actually. We continue to see the millennials being the greatest uh, mover demographic. And this is really welcome news for our regional communities because they're, they're young, they're, they're well-educated, they're energised and they're, in many cases, bringing their family and looking to create a whole new life where, where they're participating in the community. And just on those regional communities, can they deal with, with this influx? They're saying, do they have the infrastructure and even the employment there to, to cope with that? We know that our housing uh, vacancy uh, rental vacancy rate is still hovering below 1%, which is really worrying for us. Um, so this is something that we continue to talk to governments about to ensure that we are looking at this trend of migration and adequately thinking about how we might plan and support this transition that we're experiencing across the nation. Yep, unfortunately, housing remains a critical issue, no matter whether you're in the city or the country. Uh, Really interesting insights this afternoon. Liz, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you.
Boeing's delivered its plan to improve quality and safety to the US aviation regulator after serious issues with its aircraft put the manufacturer under scrutiny. There will be improved employee training and communication, increased inspections, tighter controls over suppliers and a cap on the number of planes produced. This is about systemic change and there's a lot of work to be done. Our goal is to make sure that Boeing makes the necessary changes and has the right tools in place to sustain those changes. The changes were sparked by the blowout of a door plug on an Alaskan Airlines flight where it was found bolts used to secure the panel were missing. King Charles will attend this year's Trooping the Colour after his doctors gave him the all clear, but the Princess of Wales is in doubt. Kensington Palace says she won't make the traditional dress rehearsal as she continues her own cancer recovery. Ashley Mullaney has the latest from London. It's a big date in the calendar for Kate. As Colonel-in-Chief, it's her job to oversee the rehearsals for Trooping the Colour. But the palace has made it clear she won't be returning to public duties until she's given the all-clear from doctors, and that hasn't happened in time for this year's rehearsals. The good news, the King has been given the green light from his doctors to attend his big birthday bash on June 15th. He won't be on horseback like he was last year. He'll be in a carriage with Queen Camilla by his side, watching the military procession. Uh, we can also expect to see him next week. He is planning to attend the D-Day anniversary uh, events in Normandy. As for the Trooping the Colour, a big event on the British royal calendar. Kate is out for the rehearsals. A big question mark now as to whether she'll attend the big day. Your Friday finance update is next. Then Target recalls baby clothing. The important details parents need to know. Plus, John Lennon's guitar, missing for 50 years, sells at auction. And it's 21 at Cronulla right now. I'll have the full forecast soon. In 7 News. Yes! Treating back pain as child's play. Relief without the surgery. It's paid off. I'm wonderful now. The high-tech help giving Aussies their lives back. Got them to start thinking about pain differently. Our exclusive medical report, 7 News at 6. Donald Trump, guilty. What it means for him, will he go to jail? This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. What it means for the US election, can he still become president? Expert analysis from our team of reporters in a Donald Trump special on 7 News, tonight at 6. Target's recalled a line of baby clothes over safety fears. It's the pink rabbit unisex bunny suit in sizes ranging from newborn up to two years. There are concerns long loose threads inside the garment could entangle arms and legs. Customers are being urged to return the item for a full refund. Well, it was a good session to the end of the trading week. Here's Laura Bezzerati from Comsec. Happy Friday, and it certainly was a happy Friday for the Aussie market. We finally put an end to that nasty three-day losing streak with our market lifting by 73 points or 1% to have our best day in around two weeks. Unfortunately, though, it wasn't enough to post an improvement over the course of the week, but over the month of May, we did see a gain of half a percent, meaning we've improved for six of the past seven months. Across the sectors today, all but one of the 11 improved, with most up by at least 1%. Telix Pharmaceuticals was the top performer of the day and saw to a fresh record high after making progress with its cancer treatment. Improvements from the four major banks also propelled us higher today. And finally, the Aussie dollar currently buys 66.3 US cents. Sydney 6pm News is coming up with Angela yeah. Cox and Michael Usher. Hello to you, Michael. What's on the program? Hi there, Sal. Well, we obviously we have special coverage tonight on the news making global headlines. Donald Trump guilty in that historic day in the United States. The former president convicted of fraud at his hush money trial. So the big question, will he go to jail and can he still run for president? We'll bring you expert analysis to answer those questions in our special Trump coverage. Also tonight, heartbreaking details on a deadly crash in Western Sydney. A P-plate driver killed her teenage passengers taken to hospital in a tragic Wetherill Park accident. The crucial clues for crash investigators. Exclusive, the high-tech help to treat back pain. How an Australian first study has uncovered the secret to pain relief in virtual reality. And was this a willy willy in Wagga Wagga? Fins and fences tossed around by freak winds as Sydney braces for its own wild weather 
this weekend. Don't often get to say that in a sentence, Sal, so really, we'll have really those. Good. I really, really enjoyed it. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we'll also have a look at a bit of uh, R&R for the Blues. That's all coming up in Sydney 7 News at 6. I'll join you then, Sal. See you then. Thanks for that, Michael. Well, a guitar played by John Lennon has become the most expensive Beatles instrument to be sold at auction. The 12-string 12, 12 Nanny acoustic had been seen or played for more than half a century. Earlier this year, it was unearthed in an attic during a house move in England. It was in near-perfect condition. An anonymous bidder paid $4.4 million for it. Next in Seven's Afternoon News, we'll have Sydney's latest weekend weather forecast. Stay with us. Good afternoon, Andrew Pinomo here in the Freedom Traffic Chopper. Well, the good news, it's dry on the roads. The rain hasn't hit quite yet. It is a busy run, though, in Eastern Creek and Horsley Park for the M7. This is the M7 right now, a slow run in both directions. A much heavier run south towards the Horsley Drive with traffic back into Rudy Hill. Absolutely everything is on sale at Freedom. Get 20 to 60% off all furniture, including sofas, dining, outdoor bedroom and mattresses store-wide. Sale on now, only at Freedom. Hello, tonight in 7 News, Donald Trump guilty a historic day in the US. Will he go to jail? Can he still become president? We have expert analysis in our special coverage. Also tonight, tornadoes and rain as wild weather moves towards Sydney and exclusive, the new simple fix for back pain. That's Sydney's 7 News at 6. We'll see you then. To the weather now and in the city today, it was a fairly warm start this morning, 12, uh, 17 degrees rather overnight, 21 today. Across the city we saw a few very light bits of rain around 1 o'clock around Badgeries Creek, generally it tops in the low 20s. We do have a changing situation on the satellite, though. We've got a cold front just currently sweeping through the southern and western parts of the state. That will push up into the northeastern corner by tomorrow, triggering widespread rain. Having a look around the capitals, 24 into Brisbane, 18 for Adelaide. Sydney tomorrow expecting rain and a top of 19 degrees, and that will continue into Sunday with heavy falls up to 60 millimetres possible on the coast with thunderstorms forecast. The good news is it should dry up by Monday. And that is Sydney's 4pm news for this Friday. Michael Usher and Angela Cox will bring you 7 News at 6. I'm Sally Barry. Stay with 7 now for The Chase Australia and thanks for joining us. Have a great night. Stream 7 News live and on demand on 7 Plus. And stay informed on 7news.com.au. Nobody knows news better.